The younger generation was taken aback by the Brexit vote. We are the ones who primarily voted to remain in the EU, and it's us that it's going to affect for the longest. Generations Y and Z may rule the digital industry, but in politics, they lag behind. How can young people partake in real policy making, apart from various youth parliaments? We are young Europeans, we have motivation and dedication, and I think they will hear our ideas uh, as new topics for them to understand that we also have a voice and we want to help solve our current problems. What about lowering the voting age to 16? In Austria, young voter participation initially mirrored all average age groups. But five years later, election turnout clearly decreased. Strengthening civic and history education at Austrian schools is one of the government goals. Who has elected the youngest head of state in Europe? Austria literally rejuvenated its leadership. 31-year-old Sebastian Kurz has his own vision. Wir wünschen uns eine Europäische Union, die stärker wird in den großen Fragen und die sich in kleinen Fragen gleichzeitig zurücknimmt, dort wo Nationalstaaten oder Regionen gut entscheiden können. Operation Libero is a young Swiss political movement fighting for liberal ideas. We say that Schweiz soll kein Freilichtmuseum werden. Ein Freilichtmuseum, wo am besten noch das Schild dran hängt, bitte nicht berühren. Should younger activists put older politicians in their place? If young people want to assume real responsibility, they must be given access to the captain's seat. Welcome to the Open Forum. My name is Nicola Forster. I'm the founder of the Swiss uh, think tank Voraus, Forum Außenpolitik, and I have the big pleasure to, to lead this discussion. Um, the Open Forum is a place where participants of the WEF, of the Forum here, get together with civil society, with you. And the goal really is to have an intense discussion with you, so please prepare your questions, your ideas. We really want to have this dialogue. And um, to, to kick it off, we'll start here on the panel, but after this, I will open it. Now, um, the motto, the slogan of the forum of this year is creating a shared future. Creating a shared future uh, in a fractured world. So when we talk about future, we should talk about future generations also. And at the topic of today is therefore very timely. It's rejuvenating European democracy. The young generation will live with the impact of the policies that we have today. The impact of politics, if it's in climate change, uh, social, uh, social policies, global cooperation, the young generation will, all, will, will feel all these impacts. How can deepening engagement in European democracies strengthen a sense of shared responsibility? That's the questions we're asking ourselves today. And as we have seen in the video before, there's a big frustration by young people, as expressed uh, after the Brexit vote, where young people didn't feel that their voice did count. But there's also hope, as we can see with Sebastian Kurz, who has been elected as chancellor at the age of 31 years, or Flavia Kleiner from Operation Libero here in Switzerland, who is a political activist. I think she's 27 years old and has a real impact in Swiss politics. So that's both sides for the younger generations. Now we have a great panel here um, on stage, and I think they don't need further introduction, just a very, very short introduction. Pascal Beriswil, she's the State Secretary of the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Federal Department for Foreign Affairs. She, um, when she was, when she, after finishing her law studies, uh, she was working as a judge and she also was working, was in, in politics. So I hope that she will share some more um, details about that. Then we have 
Michal Krupinski. He, he is the CEO of the bank Pekao in Poland. And he, before that, he was also a very young minister in Poland. Um, I think the age of 24 years, you joined government. Yes, 25. 25. Um, and he was also working for the World Bank. So he has the experience of the private sector and also public sector. And then next to Michal is Sidrune. Sidrune um, is the director of group sales of Eldes, and she founded a very interesting organization, which is called Women Go Tech, to bring more young women into tech. And she's also a global shaper. And then, and last but not least, uh, Desislava Karapchanska. She's the business development uh, head at Watt and & Volt. And she also founded, or you're also part of the, an initiative which is interesting, which is called Regeneration, the Regeneration Program. And you try to reduce unemployment. Uh, you're originally Bulgarian, but now live in Greece. Exactly. So please give a hand to our world. <laughs> Now, um, to kick it off, I would like to ask all our panelists to share a story or a snapshot of their own country where they could see that the young generation has an impact. Or, if this is not true in their country, something they're really frustrated about. And I would like to start with, with maybe with you, Desi. Okay. I'm going to give an example. I'm coming from an uh, energy utility sector. Uh, when you hear about energy utility, you think that everybody that works in the company is above 50. And we are, uh, the average age is 30 years old, and we're a group of 200. When we want to implement something in Vattenwort, we say, okay, how is it done normally? Let's do it totally differently. Implementing and using also technology. So uh, this model has helped us to become one of the fastest growing companies in Greece and in Europe. And uh, this company was born in the midst of the economic crisis in, in Greece. That is also a very important factor. So um, I believe youth can implement and assist in growth, not only in the private sector, but also in the public sector. And this is a good paradigm from the private sector. Thank you so much. Um, may I ask you, Pascal, to share? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here and share some of the recent developments also in Switzerland. And I think the, the most beautiful example is the one you have chosen also for the film, is Operation Libero. Um, in Switzerland, we have a direct democracy at every level. So you theoretically can get involved and you can influence um, political processes. The, the question whether young people engage is, is it attractive enough? Do they believe that they can change things? Is it creative? And so Operation Libero was a movement, not a political party, traditional political party, but which decided when you had a vote, uh, which would have obliged Switzerland uh, to be non-compliant with international law, that they would get engaged. And so they created with new technologies, very creative clips, and they participated in very many discussions, fora, and uh, Flavia Kleiner also challenged one of the most uh, prominent conservative politicians. And they gave all of that a touch of it's also fun to get uh, involved, it's fun, and you can make a difference. And finally, this vote um, uh, was won as they had um, tried to influence it. Then, of course, you had all the analysis. Was it because of them? Was it not because of them? And I think that is actually irrelevant because they saw that as much it's, I mean, they, they made an, they had an impact. Was it more or less is not the key question. The key question is, do they have the wish and also the energy and creativity to continue on this path? And I think they very much have. And so uh, that is one model. It, uh, it combines information sharing, creativity, uh, the fun, and the aspect of having 
the possibility of having an impact. And so that, I think, is a model uh, which could maybe be applied also in other places. Do you feel that this is because of Switzerland, because like, participation is part of our DNA with direct democracy and so on, that people do something, get engaged? You know, it's clear that other than with the Brexit vote, which was a vote which came um, after a long time with not so much of a tradition of voting regularly in Switzerland, you regularly go voting. That does not mean that it's interesting and attractive for young people. So I think the direct democracy gives you some instruments at hand, but it's always a work in progress. You have to keep people interested. And one of the magic words for me is political education, and that goes for all the countries. Um, you need to have debates at school. Uh, you can influence family a little bit, but some families are maybe less interested. So in school, at school, you need to have political debating as a, a topic which is relevant. And, um, and you have to have a, a, like not too much distance, and that may be a dis difference in Switzerland from other countries or from the European level. You, you, sh you need to have also closeness uh, from the political institution and the larger people. Chidruna, you were nodding, <laughs> listening to what Pascal was saying. Is it similar in your country, or could you please share a story from your country? I think... Uh in uh, Lithuania, we have a, a little bit different, but I guess the, the, the general principles are, are the same of the civic engagement. But uh, uh, I want to share with, uh, with the audience the phenomenon of the Baltic countries, because to give a bit of a historical background, uh, we regained our independence in 1991 from the Soviet Union, which means that uh, not that long uh, time ago, uh, we had a complete change of economical and political system. And then the, we were at the situation that, okay, so there are two generations, one mostly uh, without uh, the skills of the, of the language that would keep us competitive in, uh, in the global arena without the, uh, uh, the technical skills, mostly corrupt uh, generation. And there is a young who are looking towards the Western world, who are looking into building this country and uh, are interested uh, to, to change the processes, how we do things. And, uh, and this is the thing that, <clears throat> so because of the lack of the skills, because of the lack, uh, lack of the competitiveness of the older generation, young people could do a lot in Lithuania. And uh, um, I was, uh, uh, as a student, I was also uh, part of the uh, uh, international uh, uh, student organization called ISEC. And then I was working with the international team. And then I saw that actually those who are Lithuanians, they would most probably get the position in business uh, at the age of 25 uh, uh, in, in the same level and compared to the, to the ones who are in Germans, I had German, a German uh, girl on the team who, who would be able to get such a position when she's 35, 40. And uh, so we could do a lot. We could manage the teams. We could build businesses. But with the power came also responsibility. And, um, and here we understood that there's, this is us, the generation who will create the, uh, the future for this country. And we don't have that much uh, natural resources. We have the talents that are, that are the most important for Lithuanian co competitiveness. And, uh, and uh, then there were uh, lots of initiatives that were coming not from the politicians, that, that was coming not from the ruling parties, that was coming from the actively engaged youth. Uh, one of the examples is uh, the initiative of the so-called um, uh, white gloves to ensure the transparency of elections. So we had, uh, we had volunteers, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, people from all over the country joining the elections as observers and making sure that we have a uh, transparent process in place. Uh, we right now have uh, an initiative to... Uh, to uh, get back the talents who went uh, to study abroad to, and uh, most probably uh, to, to uh, uh, encourage them join our, uh, our um, government. And this is, this is called Create for Lithuania. So they are returning back for, uh, for the terms in the different ministries and, uh, and off reviewing the processes, how, how the country is run, and then offering different solutions and most of them actually staying in Lithuania because they can be in the power, they can change the things. And, um, and, and these are different examples how, how youth uh, 
is engaged, how youth, uh, youth is uh, creating, uh, uh, creating the future. We, uh, we have, um, uh, and, and, and even for myself, you know, I, I don't come from the, from the different, uh, uh, from, from the public sector, I come from private, and then I saw the, the initiative that you, um, that you just commented about, the women in technology. I know that there are some processes because we're not for so long independent, uh, that would not be uh, taken care of from the governmental level. And we don't need the governments to take the lead in changing the things. Uh, we have the sense of responsibility that we can create certain initiatives ourselves and only then uh, sit behind the same table uh, with the decision makers and uh, decide what's the next step. That's very interesting, and I'm sure we'll come back to, to this initiative. Um, so the newly independent Lithuania as a place where young people have opportunities maybe which they wouldn't have in other countries. Now, Michal, could you share your sure. view from, from Poland? Yeah, I, I can only echo what's been just said. I think I was always impressed how, how in, the, in the Baltic states, uh, and similarly in Poland, uh, young people after transformation and transition took over responsibility. I think you wouldn't have been able to build institutions, um, uh, citizen society, and, and bring in transparency without young people um, taking, taking tran transparency. In my country history, in Poland's history, um, young people have always been instrumental. Um, we had a big, uh, big uh, youth movement of uh, anti-communist movement back in the 80s, part of a you know, large solidarity movement that was so important in, um, in taking over power from a, from a communist uh, 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 regime. They were in their early 30s, if not late 20s, when they actually had the responsibility to take over, over the, the country. Uh, similarly, um, uh, Poland is a very pro-European country, um, if, one of the most pro-European countries in, in, uh, in the EU. And I remember back in 2005 when we voted for EU membership was the youth vote that was so important and, uh, and instrumental. We, have, uh, we don't have, uh, our prime minister is not, uh, is not 30, similar to Sebastian Kurz, but he's in his late 40s and was also, by the way, very instrumental as a teenager in, in, uh, in taking over power from the communist uh, regime, was instrumental in the opposition movement and is, is uh, also experienced uh, banker now uh, leading the government. The president became president largely because of the youth vote at the age of 43. Um, so we have, uh, we have uh, I would say, relatively young leadership in, in the government. And my experience having served in the government now many years ago, 12, 13 years ago, is, is it is important to have young people take over power for a couple of reasons. Reason number one is, is you, we are, as, as leaders and every one of us, we are, we are in the business of managing change. And if you want to, uh, to manage change, to give an example about, you know, I was yesterday on a panel about blockchain, how blockchain can change business, not only our business, banking, um, well, many bankers think we will soon get out of business because of blockchain, <laughs> but it's also changing the way governments do business. And uh, and if you want, you know, and, and if you're if you're government, if you're a bank, uh, I, I can be talking about uh, about blockchain, Ethereum, Ripple uh, to the startups because they are the ones that can really disrupt um, disrupt the business. This reminds me of a of an interesting situation last year, exactly a year ago. On the very same day here, there was a guy who approached me at one of the panels in, in Davos, and he was telling me about this Ethereum thing, right? And I had no idea what it is, right? <clears throat> and now I realize that the value of, of Ethereum and the value of his startup is 100 times higher after one year, right? Um, so, so when you're here in Davos talking, I think, take the benefit. It's all about... Uh, um, it's all about um, uh, and countries, you, you, you know, and, and people you, you, you meet he, here. So what I'm getting at, it's so difficult to, to, to create change without having younger people um, involved. Uh, also, what I notice is once you have younger people in the government, business has to adapt, right? Because business cannot live without government, and this is regardless of whether you're Poland, Switzerland, or the United States, but, and people have to match, have to discuss a, a very similar topic, adopt, uh, adopt technology. Uh, so, so that's why I've always been a very big proponent of, of young people getting involved. Thank you, Michel. Uh, let's see if all of us will be 100 times richer when we come back next year. Um, <laughs> 
But let me ask you, Desi, um, coming from Greece, um, there has been a major crisis in the last few years. Does that help young people, a younger generation, a new generation, get into government because people are disappointed with the old generation? Uh, does it help young people get into business because business is really disrupted and is, is changing a lot? Uh, yes, a very good question. Definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, you see in Greece now uh, startups everywhere, successful startups uh, um, from people that they were started when they were 20. And then we go to the government and, um, you know, we found the situation and we um, have to face economic crisis uh, because of something we haven't created and because of something that we haven't decided to. It's because our parents or older generations decided for things or acted certain way. And now we're here, 25, 20, 30 years old, and we have to struggle and try 10 times more to achieve, to thrive, to work, because let's not forget that in Greece last year we had about 35% of unemployment for, for the youth being below the age of 35. So this is a very huge unemployment rate. And uh, we had to be flexible. We learned to be flexible. We learned to embrace technology and to use it and uh, create businesses. And uh, youth started um, to exist, let's say, and to go to governments and say, you know, can I assist you and do things? Can I help you? Can I be there while we take decisions? Um, and I believe that government has started to listen because if you see the Greek government, our prime minister is young, uh, Mr. Tsipras, and um, in the government, in the, uh, implementing smart city strategies, we have uh, young executives that come from the private sector. So yes, I would totally agree uh, with Mr. Krupinski that um, private sector can assist, can help the government, and governments should adapt and listen to what they have created. Thank you. Um, turning to you, Pascal, we're living in Switzerland. Um, our life is nice. We have a lot of money. Um, we don't need young generations, right? Um, when I look at the Swiss government, um, Somebody who would be considered young is, how old is Alain Berset? 50? Yeah. No, not yet. Yeah. People would say that he's young. In other countries, people get, well, you have been a minister at the age of 25. Is that not possible in our country, or what's the problem here? Pascal. Um, if I maybe can get back before I come to that question, uh, from what I observed in the discussion. So... Um, we were talking about Greece, how crisis can define a space for young people to get involved in private sector or also influencing government. We have been discussing um, countries coming out of a transformation of, of the regime from a more authoritarian to a democratic regime and how that can define space for young people. And I made the example of uh, direct democracy, how direct democracy can define space for young people to influence uh, politics or get involved also in, in business. So I think the conclusion maybe, if I jump a little bit, can be that whatever the circumstances are, the, the key point is to define where the space is where young people can get relevant and get influential. The conclusion must be, and I would very much promote that this can be the conclusion, that there is always a space, but leadership and young people somehow in dialogue should together define that space and, and also um, enlarge in it, if possible. Um, for me, the question is not that much how old is our current president. I think a current president under 50 is someone who has already a life experience and is still young, considered the challenges we have to face. Um, so I think really more important is how can younger people get involved and that theoretically it's possible also to be a very young president also in our system. But if I look at the question from another point of view, we also said it's about responsibility. How can we make young people also responsible and really somehow get them involved in order that they take part in policy making? And there, um, 
from all the discussions I had, and I went to a lot of schools discussing democracy in modern times, I realized that um, what had been for us has, has been a given. We grew up in a democracy. Maybe for, for younger democracies, this is not so self-evident. It's self-evident in our country. And at the same time, and it's not only in Switzerland, but also in other uh, democracies, I think it's a worldwide trend, um, this division, separation of power, the influence of media, all that has become shaky in terms of how it can influence and also threaten democracy. So I would like to also see where can, there, where can be the responsibility of young people to avoid that from happening, to avoid courts from being neglected, to avoid um, those different powers which have been you know, constitutional for a democracy, for a vibrant democracy, how young people can, and maybe I can give that then as a question to the, to the public, to the younger public, um, how can young people make sure that this uh, separation of power, the media, that all that keeps the, the, the very fundamental basics of our democracies? That's a very good question. Do we have somebody in the audience who would talk about, who would like to talk about this? or ask a question. I think we have a gentleman here. Yeah. I think we have one, one question here. Sorry. Yeah? Do you like to start with a question? Yeah. yeah. So my name is Ella, and I am a student in Switzerland at Conti Borden. And, you know, I've read a lot about articles about the new presidents, and, for example, Serbia has a new president, a woman, and the second thing what came in my mind is what I've read, that they are all very conservative. President of Serbia, um, the new president of Ireland, conservative, and also my best example, Austria, with courts. And now, actually, their leadership um, reminds me, actually, of, their, of my grandmother. How is she thinking? Because... Um, this strengthen of our own nation, no mix between cultures, fear of new things, um, fear of losing jobs because of the globalization. So what they do is strengthen our nation, like, for example, Donald Trump building a, a wall for no immigrants, Stefan Kurz with a really hard um, immigrants policies. And now my question to you is, do this young politicians, and this young now, please, in quotation marks, do this really bring fresh air into politics? Young people acting like our grandmothers. Uh, <laughs> yes, Michel. Yeah, so I, uh, let, me, let me maybe also respond to, um, to what you have said in, in defense of Swiss democracy. Um, <laughs> I, will, I will just say the, the government doesn't need to be young. I think the government just, first of all, needs to be smart. And uh, secondly, the government needs to be accountable. And, and let, let's face it, we face a very big crisis of accountability of politicians through, particularly in Europe. Um, you, you were showing a movie with, with people protesting in the streets, and I, I can tell you in some of the countries in, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, not in Switzerland, where youth unemployment is low, but there are countries in Europe, in the south, where unemployment, where half of young people are unemployed. And, and my worry is, despite of the very good global economic conditions, most, I, I would say, if we had measured the level, levels of optimism of Davos Forum participants, if there was like, a, it's, you know, self-diagnostics big data, I think this is the highest levels of, of optimism, at least since I've been coming here. And I, I would say, you know, if, despite of all of that, I don't see that people, and particularly governments, maybe also businesses, are confronting the real problems that we're facing, not only in the developing and emerging world, but also in, um, in Europe. And I think the problem is, is that we do have a crisis of accountability. Brexit is a very good example, um, where, you know, I, I'm a CEO of a bank, right? And if I had a Brexit-like event with my bank, where I lose, you know, with, with UK, Europe is losing 18% of GDP one-third of investments, and you can, you know, 55% of tea consumption. Um, and, you know, if, if you had a, if you had a, this is a true, true statistics, by the way, if you had this, such an event, uh, you know, I would need to resign, right? And I haven't seen many politicians back in, in Brussels 
uh, who were held accountable of what happened with Brexit, and Brexit is not a local problem, I think. It is a pan-European problem. So what I'm, what I'm uh, trying to say here is I think something that needs to be resolved is, is, is crisis of, of, of uh, accountability. And, uh, and I think my personal view is there are also lessons learned in terms of accountability uh, from, uh, from direct democracies um, uh, such as Switzerland. Accountability, a very important point. Uh, Desi, can I ask you, coming from Greece and also having the experience in Bulgaria, is there a new generation of politicians which is fundamentally different? When we look at that uh, interesting question from the student from County, County Baden, is, is this different or is this the grandmother's, grandfather's politics, just with younger faces? What I would say is that, first of all, for sure, it depends on who you are and where you come from. What I want to say is that you don't have to be 20 in order to learn to be innovative, in order to take risks, to be accountable, but at the same time not be afraid to make cha implement changes. So I will agree <laughs> that it's not about the age, it's about adaptation, Politicians should adapt fast. Everything is happening very, very fast today. Uh, they have to be flexible. And if they uh, don't know something or are not aware of something, they should be open to copy best practices of the same thing that has been implemented, for example, in another country. Yesterday, uh, we were in a very interesting lunch discussion uh, for the future of jobs and um, a CEO of an energy utility, a um, huge one in um, Colombia said, I'm not a millennial because I'm 55 years old, but everybody in my company calls me an old millennial because <laughs> everything new I, I see, every, everything I hear, I want to learn about it and I want to try it. I want to I wanna make the change also. So it depends on the age. It depends on the character. Uh, it depends on how much you're, um, you don't want to, go and take the safe road and you want to risk for the better of your country. Thank you. Yes, she Maybe me. just a very quick point to add is um, we cannot expect uh, uh, the, uh, the top leaders to only look uh, from their side and provide the accountability if they are not asked for. And uh, the transparency uh, is, uh, is also coming when it is uh, when it is uh, not only offered, but when it is asked uh, for. So we have, we have a case that, you know, if, if, we, uh, if we want them to be, uh, to be accountable and if we want them to be transparent, what are the watchdogs that we created as the civic society and how uh, deep are we uh, analyzing certain actions and how much are we educated to do that? And in order to... Uh, to create that uh, within the country, definitely it takes, it takes a long time and it goes back to the educational system, which encourages criticism, analytical skills, and only then uh, civically engaged society. But, uh, but it's not that we should ask for certain, uh, certain competency. We should be responsible as well to, to create that. There's a good example in, in Lithuania, you know, there's this uh, called Freedom TV. So it's it's on YouTube. It's pledged by uh, by contributors, and uh, it is um, so-called watchdog to the existing uh, parties, to the existing government, to question their decisions. And uh, and it's not anymore uh, funded by the businesses or or by uh, by the government. It's it's funded by people. It's a very nice example. Thank you very much. We have a second question. And the gentleman over there, do we have a microphone? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I think there is a deeper question behind the question of generation. We heard it's not a question of age. You can't be very young and you can make a very wrong politic only for special people. So the question is deeper. I come just from Lesbos. You are from Greece. I was in the refugee camps and we have a big problem. Even the young people in Greece are refugees. They leave their countries, very good educated, they go to Germany, everywhere. Though we have not refugees only uh, outside of Europe, inside of Europe, Italy, wherever. And my question is, when I was in Lesbos 2015, there were thousands of young people from Europe 
and helping to survive the people. There was no EU institution, nobody now exchanged, but the problem stayed. My question to you is, um, what can we do for the, or propose for us and the young generation to do to overcome that people have to leave the country? Hunger, economy, weapons, climate change. That everybody can have find a way. That nobody has to be a refugee in this world. Not to solve problems for a special part for Europe. This is a big question in the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, yeah. <laughs> I would like to add to this question: How? What can we do if people have already left? What can countries do when people, young, the young generation has left because of all these problems? How can they be drawn back? Who wants to take this? This year? Um, that's an amazing question, and actually. We are working a lot. As a, as a, um, I'm a global shaper and I'm a part of the Athens Hub. So our main project is called Regeneration. We are working on it the last four years. Um, it was founded by a shaper called uh, Panayos Madamopoulos with uh, a CEO from Coca-Cola that really supported it. So uh, our hubs has loved a lot this project. What are we doing? We are fighting brain drain. That's exactly what we are doing. And uh, the unemployment in Greece. We have managed through this program to make the, long story short, I can share with you the website and information, to have a retention rate of 85% among our interns in Greece. So we do, what we have managed is to persuade them to tell them, stay here, stay here when the country starts to grow. You should be here because you're the one that is going to make the change. If you leave, then to your question, the brain gain back, it's much more difficult to, 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 to make you come back. So, yes, we, I'm also a refugee from Bulgaria. I left Bulgaria because of the circumstances after the, after, uh, nine, uh, the 1989 communism. And uh, it's a very, very good question. And uh, here I would like to say that Europe should have a shared responsibility and should implement practices uh, and assist countries that have this problem to keep the young generation in the country. Because we are the ones that we are going to help and faster get out of the crisis, of any crisis, any type of crisis. Michael, um before, when we were behind the stage, we were discussing about your bank recruiting people from Great Britain after Brexit now. So uh, it can go in unexpected directions, this uh, brain drain or brain gain. Yeah, Could we you have, tell us more in, about in, it? in terms of HR, we have been a big beneficiary of, of Brexit. Um, with actually our, uh, our head of strategy sitting here, he's one of the uh, couple of uh, five Brexiters we we hired with international experience from best institutions. Um, I'm, I'm less worried about my own country, where you do see some waves of people coming back, uh, particularly given that the fact that we are becoming a small hub for some of uh, new technologies, including uh, I, was, I, was just, I just met, met uh, one of the largest uh, data analytics and big data companies globally, and they have... Uh, lots of people employed uh, in my country, uh, so we have good skills. However, uh, in case of some countries, there is a risk of you reaching the tipping point, and then it's simply too late. Right? It will be very difficult to you know, rebuild your uh, business and, and political elites. Um, so, so that's why I think countries have to be very careful about uh, not losing the potential because there's a lot of you know, research by different economists who actually say the biggest potential you have as a country is your population. Full stop. Shidrune, do you want to add? I think here uh, I would share a little bit maybe different perspective. Is, uh, so there are several types of migration and I'd say there is economic uh, and there is a disaster uh, based and uh, and uh, these are two different things and how we look into this in Lithuania had several waves of immigration and in very different levels 
And uh, it's not particularly bad if our you know, greatest brains are getting experience in various hubs over the world and building their knowledge, building their capacity, and uh, bringing this back either by their physical presence to the country or by foreign direct investments back. We need to make sure that the, that the instruments are created for, for these people to look into a country as a potential. And, uh, and we have at different levels, but, uh, but you know, there is, uh, there is a thing. So, so uh, the ones who studied abroad at very good universities, they came back to Lithuania to work for several years. And what they did is they actually, they lobbied international companies to create the companies here in Lithuania, the chapters that they would be interested to work at. So this benefited to, uh, to the country uh, in terms of migration. And, and I don't uh, see the migration itself as a process uh, which is uh, particularly harmful. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, we have the situations where, where we have immigrants that really are coming not only because of the economical reasons, but because of the disasters and the war and the, um, anything that's... Uh, that's uh, forcing them to leave the country. And the question is where the challenge for us is definitely is to work on the integration, to work on the understanding of these people. And what I noticed, actually, because there was no migration in uh, Lithuania before, my parents' generation, they have never been exposed to different nationalities, to different countries. That's why we became like really nationalistic and we we don't know how to talk to them we don't know how to behave with them and uh there's my personal story as well um uh, it's not a large number of refugees in lithuania but uh, but i had a refugee living in my apartment for for a month and uh i was literally calling instead of him to uh, the um, owners of different departments to find a rental place. And I was uh, dealing with these people who, who could not uh, accept the person from Syria, not because they don't have a place to live or they don't need the money that he's going to pay because he has a normal job, but because they were never exposed to a different nation. And, uh, and there are these, um, these stereotypes that... Uh, that actually is the obstacle right now for for our country to even elect the parties that would have a stand in terms of the refugee integration. Before asking you if you have a next question, I would like to turn to you again, Pascal, because in Switzerland it's, it's different. We have 25% of, of foreigners, so people are confronted, but sometimes they still vote against foreigners and we have been at the receiving end of, of migration for a very long time. Could you tell us more about your view? Um, <clears throat> maybe to say that migration for Switzerland has been an economic power. Um, but of course then we also face the same uh, challenges that sometimes people um, are overwhelmed with diversity. And, uh, and then I think, and that's something we manage rather well. Uh, the, the challenge is how to manage diversity into a political system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and voting is one of the ways to manage. And sometimes votes come out differently than the government has, um, has pledged for. But that is something we also have to deal with. That is part of integrating diversity and also um, growing ownership for, 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 for a diverse community which lives in our country. Maybe to come back to the, to the question originally, I think here the WEF is the right place to ask the question because the private sector can have much more impact and I see, think that the three made examples in how to give perspectives to people in order that they do not migrate. From the modest perspective of a government, we have a, a very comprehensive policy saying that, well, the first goal is to keep people in the region and that is by giving them a perspective. And so we, f we have an economic cooperation and development cooperation, for example, promoting very much um, the dual education system, apprenticeship, and apprenticeship system, which is something many, many countries 
from the south or the global north are very interested in. And, um, and there we also come back on, on democracy uh, because you can have such a system where you educate people in private companies in order to get them integrated into the labor market only if it is a combination of a political consensus, a consensus with the economy and with the society. Society, parents um, have to want their kids to go into an apprenticeship system and not to university, for example. And so this is the, the compromise between the, the economy, the, the political sector, and this, the society, which gives a basis. And that, again, is a very important element for a democracy in whatever country. This is not a model which can be exported in, 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 in another country. Each and every country has to find the compromise between those different sectors. But this ki kind of compromise is something which is a basic element for all and every democracy in the world. And I wanted to say also something about um, um, her question, um, uh, how, how to, like, manage, I mean, do we, do we need conservative or progressive leaders? I don't know. I think we see that sometimes the leadership is not diverse enough. I, again, I would say it's about diversity. It's not about young and old only. It's also about women, male. It, it cannot be that most of the leaders are very old white men. So I think diversity mm -hmm. is, is, is key for working democracies. But then, Integrating young people is not only about having them in the leadership, but it's about giving them the space to influence leadership, because you, it's also about civil society influence. I think it's not whether they all get to a power, power position, it's if there is enough space for all the coming generations also. It's not that this generation will get older and then be, maybe be integrated into a government, but then comes the, the next generation. So having on one hand the space for younger generations to influence government, and in the government having diversity in, of all kinds, that I think are constitutive elements for a, um, a working and modern democracy. Thank you. Turning... <laughs> Turning to a young person again uh, from Kantonsschule Baden, um, please, your question. Hello, my name is Arne, and I'm also from Kanton Baden. My question is about the political system. And um, as we saw in the film, many young people are angry at the system as it works now, at how the politics work. And um, it already get, got mentioned as well that young people are very flexible and it's for many young people it's hard to just um, label their political orientation to one polit political party and my question is therefore is it even necessary to have these different established um, political parties we saw Emmanuel Macron uh, who had no political party behind his back but still managed to um, be the president of uh, France. So young people, they want to break with the system they have now, and therefore they don't want to um, support, I don't know, in Switzerland, maybe the SVP and the FDP. They want something new. Would you join a party as a young person? Um, no. <laughs> Why not? Um, first of all, I'm... I don't really think that I am the best person to change anything in our society, in our politics. I don't think I'm able to uh, do such things, but... I think you are. <laughs> Thank you, but no. <laughs> so, I don't know, I don't really support all of this political party system that you have to belong or you have to comply with all the interests of one political party. And I don't want to say, okay, I'm more of a progressive, leftish person. I don't want to say, okay, now I have to go to the SP or whatever. So I want to be free from any political agendas, basically. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Who wants to take this? Yeah, Desi. Yeah. I'm sure you are not what you said. <laughs> and maybe here is the moment to say that 
youth, we, you, you have to believe in yourself. You have to work on yourself to know your values, to know what you're good at, to improve yourself if you're not good enough at something and you hear no from somewhere. But really, you should never say that I'm not the person, I'm not the one to influence. We each influence people around us in our mark micro worlds, and this is also an influence. And I'm sure you have a lot of potential in that. So it's just a comment. Important comment. Thank you. Sidruna? Yeah? I was just... Uh, um, we had a very interesting conversation with uh, one of the YGLs during the, during the lunch. It's like, uh, question whether the youth uh, working with the new technologies might change or might not change the, uh, the uh, political systems as well. Uh, we were discussing about the blockchain as a possibility to give uh, uh, confidence into the expert-based uh, decision-making, for example, you know, uh, maybe in the future would be able to do that. In like uh, for the economical questions, I'd like to this person to vote for me. Maybe for the uh, for the foreign uh, affairs, I'd like this person to be uh, to decide, be, um, you know, on behalf of me. These kind of things. So, so we should look a little bit broader of what can we do uh, with the liking Facebook liking system, you know, and as well uh, the rating systems and the confidence systems. We, we can uh, find the ways of uh, contributing to it. And uh, it's, it's a little bit sad, and I'm very grateful that Desi, you know, uh, commented back. It's a little bit sad that we think, we as a young person, and I can also, uh, you know, relate to that. We think that we're not the ones to get there, and we're not, uh, not uh, confident enough to, to actually change it when it's not the case. Maybe it's the responsibility that has to get back to us. Are you active in a party, political party? No, I'm not. No. Why not? Why? I, I think here, you know, for me, it is, uh, it is the decision. I think I feel responsible for what's happening, so I, I kind of have certain, certain responsibility to contribute into the things that I'm passionate about and can do. But uh, here I'd say I don't have enough experience because I'm not a big believer in uh, the age particularly as, uh, as the reason to join the particular, particular, uh, particular party or, or you know, the government is uh, because I think that even in the governments in the parliament there should be a good combination of young and very active and interested in it and experienced. So I am pro-experience right now and uh, and I think this is this is what I'm trying to figure out myself. When would be the case uh, that I that I join particular forces? Maybe not the political parties, but uh, but at least the decision making elsewhere. Interesting. Thank you, Pascal. You wanted Thank to you say something. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, because I think he touched the very heart of the yeah. the, the 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 political democratic crisis we may have um, or we we may be facing. And I would join all the others by saying that. Um, I'm absolutely convinced that you could make a difference and can make a difference alone by being here and asking this question. Um, I, when I was a, around 20, uh, and that is 30 years ago, um, I wanted to get involved in politics somehow, and I found it not attractive to go to a party because no, none of the parties would cover all my interests. And after a while, I found myself ridiculous because I said, well, if everyone decides to go up to a party only if this party covers all his or her interests, then, well, everyone has his own party. And actually, <laughs> the, the, the key ha about having a, a party or a group of people who uh, make a political pressure is that we are um, many of us. And it doesn't mean that you have to be convinced on, of each and every line that your party writes. But I think this is really the point. Parties are not that attractive anymore. They are not sexy, we would say. And you see this changing in, in, in politics. One time that party wins and always with a very, very short majority. And then the next election, four years later, it's the other one. And somehow we all get a little bit fed up with that and we vote for um, protest parties like Cinque Stelle, um, 
La France En Marche maybe is a bit diff different because many of those have had a long political experience beforehand, but those like parties which just were born out of we are different and we are not established parties usually are not that good in governing. I mean, look at the reality of those parties who get to power. So we need to find other models, and I would really encourage you to look for that other models because at the moment our democracies are based on parties party systems. So if we want to change that, we have to uh, get at work and find, I mean, Operation Libero is certainly an interesting model, but it's not, not a model which is integrated in our system, in our political system. So we have to find models of political pressure groups who have, who are able to be integrated into a working democratic political system, and we are not yet there. So I think that there is a lot of work to do for four hours and all the young people here to get our system, all the parties, maybe change the parties so that they are sexy again for young people to get involved and to change things. Wow, thank you. <laughs> but now... Michael, I really on, on, on want point, to know from, from you, because you joined a political party very early I've on. I've never, never been a member of any party. Really? No, no. Okay. But uh, <laughs> I, my, my hypothesis would be that, uh, that uh, equally to some other sectors and industries, technology is also disrupting party politics. Okay? And I can give you a couple of examples. And, and I think this electoral success of Macron and Trump maybe extreme examples is good case in, in point. Before, you had to spend on TV advertising. Depends on the country, but this is a rule of thumb, right? I remember there was a research out 15 years ago in the United States which said that an average congressman is spending 80% of the time on fundraising right, during the time in office for TV, TV campaigns. As we all know, um, and and I'm, I'm, and I'm pretty sure people uh, also, including in this room, are watching less and less television. Television is, is becoming less important in terms of campaigns, delivering your message. And I think what you're facing with Internet, uh, social media, is, is, a, is a Gutenberg moment uh, also for politics, right? Uh, which means that, uh, that you no longer, as a politician, need to re rely fully on your campaign machine by a, by a political party which can be a good news uh, for people who want to get involved and, and, uh, and create uh, um, impact. And as you said, right, you, you, you only know it a minute after that you have just created an impact even with your, your question. And, uh, and there's this uh, you know, quote from Walt Disney who said that everything seems to be very difficult until it's done. <laughs> that's, that's very true. We have another question here. Um, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, good. So um, I tried to engage in policy. What's your name? Sorry. Um, I'm Miriam, mm -hmm. and I live in Germany, and I tried to, um, tried to be active. So I went to two different parties, um, and um, I, yeah, I didn't do it for a long time because I recognized at a meeting that it was always about votes, how can we get a lot of votes, and so... <laughs> uh, Pretty much everything was focused on old people and families, so they, they discussed, oh, what can we do in this school? Oh, no party did that yet, so we, we are the first one who do, does the, uh, who do that, and so we will make an impression. And um, So I skipped again, because uh, my interests as a young person were uh, not focused in this meeting, um, and so this is kind of a problem, because they are only old people, um, they focus only uh, these topics, and because uh, old people uh, mainly uh, like are the most important voters, um, they are even focused more. So how can we um, make a change there so that uh, young people are interested to be active because um, their topics are also addressed? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Thank you. Uh, I think we can take another one. I've seen a hand back there. Yeah, in the back. Uh, hello, I'm Jan. I'm a PhD student here in Davos. Um, so actually I have, I have two questions and I'm very happy that we switch to the politics from the business. Uh, so <laughs> when it comes to business, I'm, I'm fully approved the idea of young people there. But when it comes to the politics, I, I'm quite concerned. 
And my concern is, is about the age, because what I have and all of you, uh, we are living in a very good world and uh, we have pretty good conditions. And in comparison to my parents or to grandparents, uh, they didn't have these opportunities that I have. So they have to face war, uh, communism, uh, and all these uh, difficulties. And I'm afraid that if we go to the politics right now, we don't have this experience. And right now we will focus more on ourselves and not to be united with other nations. And this I'm afraid of looking for the other countries, uh, like Brexit is an excellent example, where people, I think, they more focus on their country than on the whole European Union. And so this is the first aspect that I think we are not educated well to be uh, politicians right now. And I would love to be a politician, but I think my education system is not good enough and because I don't have the experience that my parents and grandparents had by default. And because of that also, uh, I think that uh, right now among my colleagues, uh, I see the, the phenomenon which I con called people don't care. And people simply don't care about the war in the Ukraine. They don't care about the presidents of the other countries because uh, they are living in a very good conditions. And it's very good that we have money and we have the hunger. But what do we have to change in the education so we think about others? Thank you. <laughs> do we have one more question and then we turn? Yes, please, in the front here. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Hem from uh, Iraq, from Middle East, and uh, I'm not immigrant. I just I came from the Air Force <laughs> Forum. Uh, I have a question, actually. Uh, the key question is here now we have to ask, do we need a populist government, a populist young government, or a smart uh, government keeping the old politician right now in Europe? How do you mean? The question here is that, do we need a young populist government, or just we have to keep the current politicians, whether they are old or not. We have to find the politicians and officials who defend the global values. The problem is that now in Europe. I think Austria and the Chancellor, the young Chancellor, is not a shining example. Yes? Why we have to praise him when the global values in Austria is under, in danger and they don't defend it, actually? Should the politicians, or will we see a new generation of politicians who will be slave to social media and to do what the social media and people on social media say, will be slave to likes and comments in Europe? So the question is here. Really, we have to be concerned about the future of Europe and the world in general. Do we need a young government, populist government, mm a young populism, as we have seen it in Austria, or we have to find another way or to, to keep the uh, old uh, politician right now, like uh, in Germany. Or we have mm. another good example. In, in France, as they mentioned, Macron, mm. a young, and he's not a populist, and he still defends the global values. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. So we have uh, three questions. The first one um, on how could we integrate more topics into politics which appeal to young people uh, based on your own experience in, in Germany where people only want to build roads, but that's also typical for Germans. Um, <laughs> now, second question, uh, the experience of Europe. Um, so we had war um, not so long ago, but if there's only politicians from the new generation who don't have this experience, do we lack something? Is it better to have people in politics who have a long experience, who know why Europe should work together? And then the third question about young populists um, who don't care about global values. Um, is there a new generation? You can just pick any of these, and I sure you will find one which is interesting for you. And please, only one. Yes, Shidrun. Okay, so... Uh I would. Uh, I don't remember the name, Miriam. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, I want to come back to that uh, as well. How do? How can we engage? You know, and uh, as the global shapers in Lithuania, we had the same question. How do we engage? Some of us are interested to go into the politics. Some of us were there, not happy, and so on. And uh, 
So very different uh, backgrounds. And uh, and there was a question that every, because uh, in Lithuania there's a phenomenon that we are still born in the smaller cities. You know, we, we went to the capital, we live right now in the capital, but but our parents live in the smaller cities. And uh, we have a, a, a case that uh, the economy is built on the capital. And, uh, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, the regions are there uh, generating the uh, the economical benefit there as well so what was happening is that uh, there was there was an interest to go there go there to the municipalities and uh, start initiating the conversation we might not be together with them we might not be a uh, part of them but uh, it does not mean we cannot find the way how to get to those politicians and start discussion about the vision of the city, about the foreign, uh, about the direct investments into their city's economical situation. What happened? We initiated economic forums of the village and the city town X and Y, you know, and then it started as a private initiative. Uh, then it continued to become the Shapers Initiative. And what happened then is even though the politicians were not that open, uh, at the very beginning, there were some cities where they uh, they were against, and uh, we faced a really closed door. But uh, where we made it, politicians noticed that this is something they can be involved, and this is something that they they are interested at. In, and there are in the room when you organize the conferences and discussions in the room, there are ideas that they need to listen to and uh, they need to pay attention. So there was a, right now, like we have them in, in, in different cities and so on, but, but this was an example that you can um, find the way to open the door and raise the, uh, the discussion. It, uh, it does not mean that you have to be part of the, uh, of the political force. And to me, yes, I'm not in the party. Uh, yes, I am coming from the business. But that does not mean that I cannot raise questions, and it's actually part of learning process, which I enjoy a lot, how the decisions are made, what are the competencies needed there, and who are my allies among those politicians whom I would be interested to vote for or support because I see that they get things done. And definitely, you know, Lithuania is not a big country, and uh, and uh, I have people that I know in the uh, in the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the government uh, in the parliament as well, and in the municipality decision makers. And there are people that I would not vote for because I have worked with them, and I know that it's very difficult to get the things done from them. But there are the ones that, based on these initiatives, I know that I can support and I can trust. Thank you. Michel, yeah, which sure. question to take do you up pick? on Miriam's point, I think it's a very relevant point. And I might be controversial here, but uh, there are people who say that there is a flaw in the democracy, which is basically that you are only eligible to vote at the age of 18. Right? Uh, and there is a concept called Demony voting after Professor Demony in, in uh, Stony Brook University, I think, Kinderwald, uh, which is about about lowering the, the age. And when you think about it, you know, some of the problems we face in particular with municipal elections and the fact that, you know, we, you, you said that I people maybe care less about you know, kindergartens and schools is, is because uh, uh, families are with children below 18 are not represented here. And, and when I think about our bank, you know, I'm spending 50% of my time in retail banking trying to, uh, to think how I attract people who are 18 or below 18, right? <laughs> this is my voter base, right? <laughs> because they are the ones who will be opening or are opening accounts. And, uh, and if, we are, if, if you think we are rational human beings, then if someone doesn't, is not 18, then why should I care <laughs> as a politician, right? They don't vote. <laughs> they don't count. Uh, so, uh, so this is an interesting concept, and I know it was you know, discussed in Germany we, you know, uh, a, a couple of years ago and, and some other countries in the world. Um, and, uh, and I think it is, it is indeed uh, worth thinking about because there are governments, including in Europe, uh, which try to uh, reform Social Security, and then guess what? They face with the fact that uh, retired and pensioners make up 
more than 50% of the voters. So how can you do anything against? It just the numbers don't add up, right? So, uh, so, so I think this is a, this is a, I, I think a topic worth uh, worth exploring. Now on, uh, can I take one more? Oh, no. Okay. Super short. Super short. Okay. <laughs> On the second topic, I think you, you did have uh, leaders uh, coming to power in Europe uh, uh, and globally, including the United States, because of, uh, of anxiety and some people you know, protesting around the fact that, as I said, I think uh, democracies are, are not fully accountable and are not delivering. And then, you know, guess what? Some of, them are, some of the leaders are young, like Sebastian Kurz. Some of them are not that young. Uh, and, and have come into power. So I, don't, I wouldn't really say that you know, people in protest against unaccountable, say, democracies are not de delivering a voting, uh, a voting younger governments in. I just think you, know, you have a, this distribution of age and probably you vote for something new, so not the politicians who've been there for some time, and that's why maybe the, the, the outcome. Let's go. Thank you very much. I, I would maybe... Um react to the gentleman who said, well, our grandparents had that experience and we do not have it. And, and um, I share part of your conclusion that we maybe lack solidarity no? in this um, new society, global society, um, which at least in this part of the world is, is very much at, um, has, has very much wealth. Uh, maybe we lack also a little bit tolerance, and there I would say go and vote for your leadership, but maybe if the leadership and also a vote does not come out as you wished for, that's also part of the game. You have to um, accept that and somehow try to deal with it. But I wanted to say what you have, what your parents and grandparents did not have, and which is very powerful instruments, I, I, and I'm fascinated when I um, observe my children who are 19 and 22, lived all over the world, currently study in the UK. Um, you have communication, you have technology, you have mobility, much more than uh, your parents, us, when we were younger or our grandparents had. So I was very, very fascinated, for example, my daughter used to participate in the European Youth Parliament. So they gather, they debate, and then they stay in touch via communication technologies. So what my um, suggestion would be, so connect with other young people who have maybe similar ideas, also different ideas, um, debate, find out what your priorities ha are, be very careful with that um, uh, technologies and information and communication. When I asked my children what for you is the most relevant aspects of rejuvenating democracy, they both went on and on and on and saying manipulation in, in, in the internet. Um, we have to make sure that uh, there is, um, well, all the challenges with net neutrality. So I think that is a real challenge. So be careful with information and manipulation, but then make us accountable, as, as he said, for the implementation of these initiatives, take initiatives, come to the governments, ask them for, for, for implementation in the, ways, in the ways you have at your disposal, and there are many ways you have already, and then take, make us accountable for the implementation of that. Thank you. Desi. Well, um, I've heard from a politician that half of my time I have to work on how to get elected, and the rest, when, once I was elected, on how to get re-elected. <laughs> so actually, that's what I was doing. And he was quite disappointed from that because he had values. And um, I see a, little, a lot in the discussion black and white, and uh, old and young, and uh, experience vs ideas and values. There are older politicians that have values and ideas. What I would say is that if I had the access to a social media platform where I see actually the people I'm going to vote for, for being evaluated from someone that really can tell me the truth, I would be more um, confident to vote for him because the one party is saying that the other does everything wrong and the other is saying like this is doing everything wrong. This is not true. There are things that every party, every politician is do, are doing right or, and wrong. So you are privileged to, new, to know some uh, politicians, but not everyone can know every politician. Uh, what I believe is that we have to seek who these people are. Do they have a purpose? Do they have values? Uh, how they were raised? 
what do they believe in, and then if they have proven that what they are ambassadors for, they can deliver it as well. And this is food for thought mostly and not a conclusion. I think that's a very good way to, to end this session with food for thought and not a conclusion because we've seen many different realities in these different countries. But we have also seen some overlapping, uh, overlapping trends. Um, so we know now that uh, accountability is a strong, strong feature which needs to be there in politics in older countries, but also on a European level. Uh, we've seen that with uh, digitization, economy, which is growing today. The need to adapt is there also for politics. Um, so I think we, we have... We don't really have a conclusion of this session, but um, we have some food for thought for the future. So um, thank you very much for attending this. I hope you also enjoyed it, and uh, let's keep this discussion going. Um, the open forum will go on for the whole week. Tonight, there's, for instance, at 6.30, uh, there's a screening of Last Men in Aleppo, a film on Syria. Uh, with the director Ferraz Fayyad, who will be here. Um, so if you want to join us uh, again at the Open Forum, that's at 6.30. And on your way out, uh, please stop at the touch screens, the large black touch screens at the back of the room, where you can explore the transformation maps which cover different industries, countries, and so on. So the, work, uh, the World Economic Forum has done a lot of work there to, to give us an overview of what is happening in this world. So thank you very much for attending and thank you to our great panel.